Hey, Ocean, I, I know that you've said you're a polytheist, but does that mean that, like, you believe in, like, you believe in multiple gods? Like, you actually believe in multiple gods? Like, like, is that a, is that a thing? Is that what you, like, really think? Is that... So there's several people that identify as polytheist by one stripe or another. And obviously there's hundreds and probably thousands of religions that are polytheist. But there seems to be multiple ways that the word polytheist is used as well. Speaking of, if you're polytheist, let me know down in the comments what tradition you follow, such as heathen, Hellenist, Taoist, Vodun, or something else. I'm interested in knowing where my audience is coming from. And I suspect it's mostly heathen, but I'm interested in being proven wrong. And if you're not a polytheist, but you're interested in learning about a tradition, let me know where you're looking. It'll give me a sense of what educational content to start making next. I've noticed three ways that people will use this term. One is quite straightforward. One is a little more complicated, but has some historical backing. And another is downright annoying and muddying and honestly shouldn't be used. And I'll explain why. The first way is probably what's most commonly meant by the term, but also, for whatever reason, it's the one that gets the most aghast responses. And that is that one believes in multiple gods, that we see deity as separate and individual, and that those deities are perceived as real. And this has commonly been called a hard polytheism, but for me, it's just polytheism. It's historically the most common position, and it's what's most often meant by the term. It's also the position that I personally hold. Often, I've gotten the question, after saying that I'm a polytheist, if I actually believe in the gods. Yes. Yes, I do. That's why I said I'm a polytheist. A little more on why I think that happens in a bit. The second way is one that has a little more subtlety, which is often called soft polytheism, which is that the experiences of presence that we refer to as gods are in fact references to a single smaller set of deities, and that different cultures are calling the same deities by different names. Now, there's some historical backing to doing this. The Romans would approach other cultures with this expression referring to other gods as the closest cognate to their own pantheon, referring to Odin as Mercury slash Hermes, or Tyr as Jupiter and Zeus, and finally Thor as Hercules. Now, this wasn't always the case, as sometimes the Romans would accept new deities into the Roman pantheon, this happened quite famously with Egyptian deities, which often would find their way into Roman culture. Wiccans, commonly, though not exclusively, will be duotheists who believe that all the gods are different representations of a single masculine divine and a single feminine divine. This has some obvious hiccups when you get into gender theory and how various gods of traditions are represented, and sometimes it can be iffy as to whether or not a deity would be the masculine divine or the feminine divine, which is part of the reason why I view this position as a massive oversimplification. Now, one might think that I'm talking about obscure deities in this sense, but if you get into a close examination, Freya could fit into either, Loki could fit into either, Odin could fit into either, Njörthr could fit into either. All four of these deities have complex legends around them, or tradition lineages, that make their gender representation not entirely masculine or feminine. Now, there's still issues with the Roman approach to this kind of interpretation. For one, it requires a complex system of what I refer to as relabeling, which is the act of defining a genuine experience as something other than what was experienced. This would be like if you described seeing a blue object to someone and they simply insisted that it was red because that's what they're familiar with. This is common with Christians and their communication with pagans. They'll often relabel a spiritual experience as one with their Christian God, or perhaps more commonly, they'll call it an experience with what they call demons. It depends, really, on whether or not the experience was a positive one within the Christian mindset. A medical moment in which a heathen might attribute to Er, goddess of physicians. A Christian might attribute to the Christian god instead. But a presence during ritual would probably be something that a Christian would call a demon, even if to the heathen it was also Er. Their only reason for committing this relabeling is that it's how they see spirituality, and they're willing to assert their religion over yours. There's no further justification. And the context that would allow for the heathen to at least posit Er, rather than some other deity, don't matter to the Christian. 
nor does the difference in how the heathen sees how Er would function, rather than the miraculous and often physically impossible ways that the Christian God is reputed to function. It's their God because it's good, or it was a demon because it was during a non-Christian religious practice, or even it was a demon because it was good, but not in the name of their God. There's all kinds of reasons for the assorted relabeling that happens. A similar but subtly different thing happens from atheism. Atheists will often do the same relabeling but presuppose a naturalistic position. Any presence during prayer or ritual or even randomly is just a brain hiccup of sorts. An earlier example where we discussed air would be appealed to a purely physical event. But the reasoning that's often put forward is simple relabeling. Polytheists often already have reasons why they're not physicalists. So appealing to a physicalist interpretation is simply asserting their view over the polytheist view. I might have to go more into that interaction with atheists later because it's the one that I find confuses atheists the most. And it's often because they think we're applying some kind of certainty to the claim when a deity like Er is thanked for a moment like that, which isn't happening. Polytheists often do not claim certainty, especially on interpretation. It's more agreement. We are, after all, not Christians. And such an appeal is usually made within the context of tradition. And within that tradition, Er is to be thanked. Obviously, to a physicalist or a naturalist, they don't think the gods have anything to do with anything in this case, and therefore they might feel the need to negate the experience. This action, however, contradicts the position that atheists often express, which is that they simply lack a belief in the gods. This kind of interaction would require a position of negation, not one that is simply a withholding of judgment. This has been a journey down a winding road of relabeling, but it's something that I find to be important because I think a lot of polytheists get hit from both atheists and monotheists, who both seem to have this strand of group behavior of wanting to make sure that polytheists do not express their polytheism. Now, they have different reasons, but from our perspective, it's functionally the same kind of thing. Now, we've talked about hard polytheism, which I just call polytheism, but can also be called strict polytheism, which is the belief that all the gods are distinct. A good way of exemplifying this would be to say that I, as a heathen, can recognize that the Greek gods exist even if I don't practice with them. Uh, and the Hellenist, who is a strict polytheist or polytheist, can look at the heathen gods and recognize their existence, although she may not practice with them. This intuits a respect between traditions and allows for a sense of pluralism between people of different faiths. And we've also talked about soft polytheism, which is the idea that the gods have many names and might show up in one culture as one god and another culture as another god. It's important to point out that both of these are coherent models of polytheism. Both of them have representations in history. Odin, for example, is seen as a god of many names, and it's possible that in history, Odin might have been seen in a way that is very similar to what we just described, that what a strict polytheist might have seen as many gods were traditionally being attributed to Odin's many faces. Paradoxically, in the same tradition of heathenry, we see evidence of the gods splitting. Freya and Frigg were likely seen as one god, rather than two only shortly before the Christianization of the Northlands. We see a deity that represents both of their attributes in some continental Germanic myths, whereas in Icelandic tradition, we clearly see two distinct deities. But going into that is a, is a whole nother video. The third way of looking at polytheism, also paradoxically, is also called soft polytheism at times, which is that the gods do not exist and are interpreted as archetypes. For me, this is not polytheism, this is just atheism. But you do have people that hold this position who go around calling themselves polytheists. I kind of get calling yourself pagan with this perspective if you're using these archetypes for spiritual exploration, but I do not understand calling yourself a polytheist in this position. Usually this position is to interpret the gods as, usually, Jungian archetypes that reveal truths about humanity, and that ritual is purely therapeutic for the individual, and that no actual reciprocity is taking place. You'll find representations of this position across traditions. There are people that hold this view about the Egyptian gods, or the Greek gods, or the Norse gods. I'd honestly argue that Jordan Peterson probably holds this position you know, like this about the Christian god, but he can't seem to define what he means by God in less than five chapters, so we'll never know, really, with any degree of certainty. But while you find this position across traditions, you only really find it in a modern setting. 
uh, this wasn't really a position that existed in antiquity, as far as I'm aware. Sometimes people will appeal to Epicurus, but he was a polytheist. Same with the tradition of Epicureans that came after him that were often accused of being atheists. They were also polytheists, but viewed the gods in a similar sense that deists view the monotheistic god today, of being uninterested in the goings-ons of humans. So, Epicureans believed in the existence of the gods, and these Jungian archetype polytheists in name are, well, they're actually just atheists, in my opinion. Which is interesting, because atheists will often try to ascribe to my position that we're really just big fans of mythology. But I think that that criticism would more aptly apply to this archetypal atheopagan position. And this may seem like I'm talking shit, but it's just the fallout of this kind of position. I know a handful of people that hold to this, and most of them don't consider themselves polytheists. They consider themselves atheists. One friend of mine calls herself Schrodinger's atheist because she finds that she bounces back and forth between the atheist position and the polytheist position. But likewise, she recognizes that one is atheistic and the other is not. And that's just being personally experimental with belief, which I think is not only valid, but incredibly interesting. But there are those who are just insufferable about it, insisting on the label of polytheist despite just being atheists. And I think that the existence of this position and these people calling themselves polytheists is in part why I get the reaction that I do when I say I'm a polytheist. Often the first question that I get is, but wait, do you, do you really believe in the gods? And no matter how many times I say yes to that, there seems to be people that are under the impression that what I mean by that is no. So how about you? Uh, which of these do you first think of when you hear the term polytheist? For me, obviously, it's the first one. But I've heard some good cases as to why people disagree with that. And finally, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. And thanks to everyone for watching, liking, and leaving a comment. And remember to find a way or make one. Mm -hmm.